In two days, Monday evening, we will begin the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles. It is the Lord's Feast, or is called the Feast of the Lord. I want to ask just a couple, three questions as we begin this morning. How much have you been looking forward to the fall holy days that commenced with what? The Festival of Trumpets, or Fiesta de Trompetas. And then uh, the Day of Atonement, which you all seem a lot more lively today than you did on the Day of Atonement. That was, that's always a fun day to speak on because the people are like, oh, you know. But uh, anyway, we, we went through another year. And as I've mentioned, God could have been really mean and just had seven days of fasting and then one day of the Feast of Tabernacles. But He didn't. So how or are we anticipating the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles? We have guests that came in late last night. Eric and Kathy Myers are here. Uh, we're glad to have you. That kind of kicked off. I, I was talking last night, and they're like, well, we got to go to bed, you know. So, uh, but it began the feast, if you will, not officially, which begins Monday night, but the anticipation of it. Why are God's holy days so important? What's the big deal? I had a guy ask me, what's the big deal with these holy day things? Here's a question that many of you will appreciate. What kind of problems and pressures have you been through in the past year or maybe the past month? Anybody have any problems or pressures or stresses or things? And the closer you get to the Feast of Tabernacles, Friday I went into town to make a bank deposit and check the P.O. box and said, my prayer was, God, please bring me back safely home without accident, mechanical breakdown, or, you know, any craziness. Because there have been years where it just, the days before, this whole year has been interesting, has it not? I asked this last question because there's a connection between it and the previous questions. Let's go together and let's read some passages. Let's read some passages that will explain what I'm talking about. I'd like you to listen for the main point as we read God's Word. I want you to listen for the main point. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. This, by the way, chapter is going to start making a lot more sense than it has. It already is. Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Now let's learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Duh. Okay, here in lower Alabama, when the leaves all start coming out, may not be summer, depending on the tree. But certain trees, not so much deciduous, but other ones, as they begin to leaf out, you know, summer is here. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, what things? Well, have you been watching some of the things that are going on? Partly no, because you're distracted by where the media takes you. But there are some things going on. When you start to see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Truly, truly, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. Not my words, but God's words. Now, I wish some people, ministers, would read verse 36. It would help a lot of folks, including them. But of that day and hour, no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only knows. Did you read that? 
But I guarantee you this year and next year, some minister will say, well, he's calculated it out. This is exactly when Christ is coming back. And you know what's going to happen if that's the day? Christ and God the Father will just, blip, God the Father, just move it. No, it's not going to be that day because you're not going to know. He doesn't just write things for the fun of it. But as in the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating too much and drinking drunk, marrying and giving in marriage, and if you want, you could say interracial, same-sex, all that stuff that God's nostrils don't like until the day that Noah entered into the ark. So things just went along just like they are now. Nothing's really, I mean, there's a few bumps in the road, but it's just going to keep going. No, it's not. It's not going to keep going. And I'm not a prophet, not just because we're a not-for-profit organization. I'm not a prophet, but... God's Word says, as in the days of Noah, it'll be the same. And they didn't know until the flood came and took them all away, so also the coming of the Son of Man shall be. And verse 40, so then shall be two in the field. So here we have a cultural setting of the Bible. The one shall be taken and the other left. It's not talking about a secret rapture. Two women shall be grinding one shall be taken, the other left. Now, what is it talking about? It's a whole sermon topic by itself. God knows the heart. Well, He's not going to take you because you're not part of the right fellowship, or you're not converted enough, or you're not, you don't pronounce God's name exactly right, or you don't keep the right calendar, fill in the blank, or you're just... Whatever you are, you don't live in the right place in the world. You don't live in Jerusalem. Whatever you want to say. God chooses. So some that think they're just going to roll right into the kingdom. Supplies, right? Surprise. Hopefully not too many, but I think there's going to be some. And others are going to be like, whoa, 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 why, why did he pick you? Because I knew you. That's prophesied. That's written in the Bible. But Lord, I cast out demons in your name. I had a television program. I did this. I did that. And he says, you never talked to me. I don't even know who you are. You knew Jesus Christ and how you acted, but in your heart, you were far from me. That's God's business to decide who that is. So watch, therefore. Look at verse 42. Watch, therefore. Again, he was talking to the disciples by an extension to us. For you do not know the hour your Lord comes. Is that another explanation of we don't know when he's coming back exactly? But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in which to watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be you ready, for in such an hour you do not think the Son of Man comes. Do you want to know when the Son of Man comes for each one of us? When you die. Think about that. When you die. Because that's when from there until you're resurrected, you better, we better hope that our relationship with God was where it was supposed to be. So does it matter to know exactly the hour and the day and the year he comes back? No. And that's what we want to talk about in part today. Who, and who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. You know why we're having a Feast of Tabernacles? Because we're doing what God has commanded. 
I've had a few say, you need to cancel. You shouldn't have it this year. Too dangerous. Well, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. We'll determine. But I'm not going to stay home locked in my house. Oh, they're going to they're gonna listen to you on the Internet. They're going to take you off YouTube, and you need to stop. I'm going to go until I can't go. Does it make me any better, smarter, tougher, wiser? But God says, blessed is the servant. We're all his servants. That his Lord shall, when he comes, find him so doing. I used to own a company. My wife and I did. We owned several over the years and sold and built other ones. One of the things that used to bother me was when I would come to a job site and they didn't know I was there. And you always had the ones that were just working like little beavers building a dam, and you had the other ones that were just sitting and watching, supervising. That wasn't their job, but they were supervising. And when you would walk in, oh, man, they would be after it, working hard. But when you were watching them and they didn't know it, a lot of times they wouldn't do anything. So God says what? To be so doing. Because he doesn't slumber or sleep. And we shouldn't be doing it just because he's watching. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over his goods. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, (laughs) you know, like the Noatian society, that attitude, oh, the Lord delays his coming. Are you kidding? There ain't going to be no flood. Hello? I mean, every dam in the world, even though they didn't have them then probably, would have to break to lift that stupid big boat off. We have people saying, why do you keep preaching about God? There is no God coming back. We might have an alien invasion, but there ain't going to be any God coming back. This old Bible stuff, listen to your news media and politicians. God bless America after they just damned him, sorry, for the last hour and a half in their actions and motives and thoughts and words. But now, God bless America. It's like a filler word. When I say meaning damn, to judge harshly, words have changed for some. To condemn, to put down, to make fun of. Right? We see it all the time. He shall begin to smite his fellow servants. Have we seen that? And to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him in an hour that he is not aware of. And shall cut him asunder, appoint his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's go continue in Matthew chapter 25 because, again, what is the main point of these passages? Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of the heavens be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. I have a question for you. Which one are you? Are you wise or are you foolish? Now, don't look at the person next to you as, well, you're foolish and I'm wise. Don't do that. But are you wise and are you foolish? Or are you foolish? Those that were foolish took their lamps, and we know this is symbolic. They took no of the oil with them. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't need it. I've been around the church of God for a lot of decades. Been around a lot of ministers, a lot of brethren. We're all part of the body, by the way. God doesn't differentiate, well, you're part of this class and you're this other class. No, he doesn't do that. But I can tell you this, you can go through the motions and do a lot of things and not have God's Spirit. Shocking? That's biblical too. The wise took oil in their vessels, which is their minds, and in with their lamps, which is talking Psalm 119, 105, says... Your lamp, you know, in the Bible talking about God's Word. While the bridegroom tarried. Do you ever get the feeling God's just like kind of waiting and, man, would you come back? But He hasn't yet. He's tarrying. 
While he tarried, they all, A-L-L, the wise ones and the foolish ones, they all slept. So lest you be one of these very righteous people, well, our group and I have, we're on fire and the rest of these Laodiceans, all you sleepy foolish people, we are the wise. It says they all slept. I've been asleep at times. I, may, I hope I'm not asleep right now, but I may be. Stop judging everybody and putting them in different places and look in the mirror. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. The spiritual wilderness of the early century there. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go out and meet him. He's coming. Then all the virgins woke up, arose, and they trimmed their lamps. They began to look into God's word and say, Oh, I better make sure I know this. I'm amazed that sometimes I ask a question and folks will say, I don't know. And I'm amazed when sometimes somebody asks me a question. I'm like, I don't know. I haven't studied it in 45 years. Why not? Well, we're all busy. We don't have time to really study like we used to, right? Pardon my sarcasm. They all rose and began to trim their lamps. This happened back in about 1994, 95 to a number of people when a group that we used to be part of began to teach things that went against the Bible. And people were, at our house was full of people. Gail was pumping out lattes so fast and people were studying and how do you prove the Sabbath and how do you prove this? And I said to Gail, it won't last. And it didn't. Are we getting close back to that again? I don't know. You tell me. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your Holy Spirit. Give us your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered and said, Not so, because there may not be enough for us and you. But you go rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. You need to go repent and get your relationship right with God. You can't do it through me. And when they went to buy, the bridegroom came. This is symbolic of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage supper, and they shut the door. Boom. Lock, lock, if you want to add to it. Just like you remember when God sealed the door on the ark and pitched it. I have to wonder how many people thought, uh, as they drowned. You know, quite graphic uh, back in the day in the Bible story book of the people clawing at the door. Afterward came also the other virgins saying, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Truly I say unto you, I don't know you. If we don't know God, he won't know us. It doesn't matter if you're part of a fellowship, part of a way of life that you think is right with your friends and your family, and ta-da! Is your relationship with God where it needs to be? Because it isn't going to matter if your rear end's in a seat of a certain group. That's not going to make it right with God. But many believe that still. Watch verse 13. <clears throat> Watch therefore, for you do not know the day or the hour when the Son of Man comes. Here's the main point of what we just read of these two chapters. It's the need to watch and stay focused. I'm sure you had this in training years ago. Stay focused on what your objective is. You've got to ignore all this stuff going on. That's what's distracting so much in this world. You can't stay focused because it never ends. And so, watch a major focus of the end time instruction of Christ. What does it mean? The literal meaning from Matthew 26, 38 and 40. Let's go over there. Matthew 26, verse 38 then he said unto them, My soul 
is exceedingly sorrowful for even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. So Christ said to his disciples, stay a watch with me, will you? Stay awake. And they said, oh, boss, we're just so tired. You know, we can't, man. We're exhausted, man. We got to go to bed. We're so tired. And he said, he went a little further. He fell on his face and he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came and he found his disciples and he said to them, can't you even stay up with me for one hour? Can't you stay awake for an hour with me? Watch and pray that you enter not in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The literal meaning of watch is to remain awake. Some of you may be going to sleep now during my sermon. I message, I don't know. I've had a lot of people sleep during my messages over the years. My dad had a saying. If he were alive, he would laugh at this. If you took all the people that were sleeping when I speak and laid them aisle to, side to side in the aisle, they'd be a lot more comfortable. <laughs> to remain awake. 1 Peter 5, 8. Let's go there. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom you may devour. The figurative meaning is to be vigilant. We are so vigilant with our health, some of us. We get the right amount of sleep. We eat the right things. We exercise perfectly. Where We keep that in tune. But spiritually, where are we? I mean, I go out walk every day. I have to, and I do it. But I see people coming by that they like, one person I said, how many times do you run a day? He says, at least five. So they're running. They want to keep everything, heart rate, no fat, good health, you know. Great. How many people are spiritually vigilant like that? Right? Or they can get up sick all week, not with the virus, but just other stuff, We'll go back before the virus. And they can get up and go to work all week, but come Sabbath, they can't come to church because they're wiped out. Well, maybe, you know. But I'm like, if you can get up and go to work, can you get up and go to church? And you bring that up, oh boy, it's like I'm probably somebody right now is like, mm -hmm, right? I've seen people drive three and a half hours to go to a training camp for football, but it's too far to drive to church to go 15 minutes. Or they'll go to a new zoo that opened, drive six hours, but I ain't going to drive an hour to church. Just saying. So, you know, there are things to be vigilant, to stay focused. Stay focused on what and why? Luke chapter 21, you knew I was going to go there, didn't you? Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. Too much food. Okay? Okay? too rich of food. Be careful during the feast with that, by the way. You don't have to go out for a huge steak every night. Okay? Or whatever it is. And drunkenness and the cares of this life. What are the cares of this life? Well, I got to go mow the lawn at my lake house. Not wrong to have either one. I have to do this. I have to do that. Got to make sure I stay up with Facebook. All the things you have to do. Got to answer every text that comes through. Every email. Got to know what's going on in the news. Got to have a ding to tell me. Got to keep up with everything. You know what it does? It distracts us, the cares of this life. 
Doctor's appointments, we have to have them. Jobs. You ever, anybody ever have a boss that the more you do, the more they give you? I've had one of those. I had one of those in the church. You could never keep up with it. They kept giving you more to do all the time. If you didn't do, hmm, no, that's not good. What about the latest movie that came out, right? I've never gotten so many emails in my life from Redbox and Netflix. I don't go to either one. The latest movie, you got to know because if you're, in, you're not going out because of this virus, you got to stay up with all the latest movies. I don't have to stay up with anything. Honestly, I don't care. Oh, can you, how can you live like that? If you don't know who won the latest whatever on, I don't even know what they have for shows now. Back when American Idol, I'm like, I'm an American, but I don't need an idol, so I'm sure there's some good things on there and enjoy it. I don't care who won the last thing. Right? Have you seen the latest segment of The Chosen? No. Oh, oh, that's all the rage for the church of God. You have to keep up with it. If you like it, great. But it doesn't mean everybody, the cares of this life, you can't do everything. It will choke out what is important for you or me. It will. It will. It will choke everything out. So he says, going on, that the day comes upon you and you're unaware. For as a snare shall it come on all that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch you therefore. That Greek word, hypnos, means can be both physically, but more importantly, spiritually. Pray always. That Then it says, and pray always. So you can watch world news, yes. That's not wrong. You should have an idea of what's going on. But do you need to know every possible weather report coming in the next three months that might, whatever? Here in the Gulf, I live here. I've lived here long enough to realize I could spend all day watching the Weather Channel telling me what was coming to destroy Banish Fort in Mobile Bay at some point in the next eight months. Or who's going to attack who? Or what next variant of the virus is going to sneak up and I'm going to die from it? And be consumed with it. I'm not making fun of it. I'm just saying there's so much to distract us that if we get bogged down in all this, then it says you'll come and what? What's going to happen? You have to be accounted worthy to escape these things that come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And in the day, well, we'll just stop there. Watch and pray. You know, when I want to go back a year ago, because it was a year ago, is this the 17th? 18th. A year ago on the 16th. So a year ago, two days, a year and two days ago, Sally had just ended and moved on, and we had the aftermath mess here. And it was, and it's still, there's things that are being cleaned up from it. That night when we had 115 mile an hour sustained winds and then it would get calm and then it would come the other direction and we lost some big trees that toppled and was, the house was creaking and moaning. I was up in the chair with uh, the electricity had gone out with a flashlight reading God's word and praying. And every so often I'd get up and look out the window and it was raining so hard the leaves were splattered against the windows and I said, God, please, if it be your will, just don't help the roof get pulled off and the house blown away and Gail and I die. And please protect us and the others, you know, down living in Gulf Shores and Foley and others. Gail comes out in her night thing and nightgown or whatever. She said, come to bed. God's got this. I said, I just want to stay awake and keep talking to him and make sure he knows I'm here. So I kept praying. I must have prayed the same prayer over and over. Father, please protect me. And if I have sinned, forgive me because I'm scared right now. Big tough guy, me, I'm scared. I trust God. 
That wind, I, I took a video of it and put it out, and somebody said, man, that sounds awful. Why didn't you go inside? I was inside. <laughs> the windows and door were shut. And when morning came, it was like, oh, boy, I've never seen trees do that, bending and blowing like that. And those of you that lived up north know what it's like when you come, wake up and there's 14 inches of fluffy snow and it goes up and over the back of the car and up and over the hood and it's all so nice and pretty. Well, do that with leaves instead. So I was praying. I was, I was very vigilant. And I thank God when I heard the one tree hit the other one and I heard the <laughs> whoop and I felt the whoop when it hit the ground out here and it stopped short of hitting the house. Big tree. And then, then, you know, all the chainsaws when the gang came over to help with, it's like, whoa, that was close enough. Why do we need to remain vigilant? Because most of the world will not. We're so wrapped up in the pressures and problems of life, the worries, the concern, the fear. The grammatical form of both verbs, take heed and watch, indicates not just a one-time event, folks. It's an ongoing process. Are we watching our spiritual condition seven days a week when we're awake? You know, I don't want to say 24-7, some of us sleep, you know, but 14-7 <laughs> or whatever it is you need to sleep. Some of us, maybe it's 10-10, I don't know, whatever, but... It's an ongoing process. Let's go to Colossians 3 because now we're going to look at what the title of this message is today. I finally got to it. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, okay, have we risen with Christ? We have that same goal, desiring to be resurrected. But our, when we went under the water and died figuratively, symbolically, and have been risen back out and received the Spirit of God, Jesus Christ living in us, seek those things which are above. Here's the title of the sermon. Focus our minds on the things above not on earthly things. If you don't make that, if we don't make, you and I make that mental shift and do that, we won't make it. It's that simple. We won't. We're not strong enough to do that. Verse 2, Set your affection, the love of your desire, on things above, not on the things in the earth. If your whole goal is to get a Mercedes SUV before you retire, fine. But don't fixate on it and focus on it. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Here's a command by God through inspiration to Paul to the church at Colossae to set affection of things on above. And as we come up to the Feast of Tabernacles, folks, stop, say, oh, I can't wait to go to this restaurant and this activity, oh, and look at the beach and look at all the things. That's fine. But the purpose of going to the Feast of Tabernacles is to rejoice before your Lord spiritually in the fear of the Lord, to learn and be taught by Him and His Word. So if you have a choice between Spending an hour and a half in the morning walking on the beach looking for seashells since I'm here on the Gulf Coast or spending an extra half hour in prayer that you haven't had in six months or a year, make the right decision. Well, who are you to tell me how to live my life? Nobody. I'm just reading what God says that set your affection, your love, your approach, your direct, your focus on things above, not on the earth. It's not wrong to go for a walk on the beach. But if you're one of those that says, well, if I can't go to this feast site on the Gulf, then I ain't going. Your things are focused on the physical. 
There, I said it. That's what God says. The things above be constantly seeking, setting your mind on. The New Testament expanded translation by Kenneth West says, the things that you constantly have your mind on. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's the news. Maybe it's others that you're praying for to where it's all about all this stuff going on instead of the things that are above, which is where right now God the Father and Jesus Christ are. Now, I'm not saying when you're working, you don't do your job because you're thinking about God. And some people are like that. They don't do anything done but their hearts with Jesus. I'm not talking about that. There's a balance. So, yes, the verb form translated set your th- eyes, affections above indicates not just a one-time event. It's like setting a clock that needs resetting. Recently in my office, I'm like, oh, what time is it? I looked up and I have this bird clock. I turned off all the bird sounds because it was annoying when I was on the phone with people. They hear that. What's that? So I turned it off. But it was stuck. The handle was, the second hand was doing this because the battery was worn out. It was still working enough, but it was stuck at like 8.32 in the morning and it was like 8 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock. So, oh, the battery. I had to go put a new battery in and reset it. Over time, our spiritual mechanisms get out of adjustment. Our battery goes bad. And you got to recharge it. You ever heard somebody say, I can need some r and I got to recharge my batteries. Our spiritual batteries. Our spiritual mechanisms get out of adjustment. How do you know when you're out of adjustment? Anybody ever go to a chiropractor? You know when you're out of adjustment. How about spiritually? Can you tell when you're out of adjustment? Well, those of you that know me could tell me when I'm out of adjustment, and I'd be happy to tell you if you ask privately. And some of you would be very happy to tell me. Maybe not privately. (laughs) You know, ask your mate. That's always, nobody likes to do that, you know. Are you out of adjustment spiritually? That's why we have seven holy days every year to help us constantly keep our focus. God mercifully foresaw the need for those opportunities to focus on His plan. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4. Second Corinthians 4, verse 6. Excuse me, verse 3. But if our gospel, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. The word there actually says perishing. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Most of the world does not have the opportunity because of Satan's deception. He's a master blinder, you know. That's why people are scared to death right now and don't know where to turn. They're blinded. Right? They're blinded. We talked about that in the Day of Atonement. Verse 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness has shined in our hearts in our minds, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthly vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Let's read that again. We are troubled on every side, but not distressed. We are perplexed, but don't need to be in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be made manifest in our body, for which we live, always delivered unto death of Christ's sake, but the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death works in us, but life in you. 
We having the same spirit of faith according as is written, I believe and therefore I have spoken. We believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus will raise up also by Jesus, shall present us with you. Paul's here is talking. For all things are for your sake that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God, for which cause we do not faint. Though our outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed daily. For our light affliction, it may not feel like it's light right now. I have some things I struggle with physically that don't seem light. I know many of you do too. For a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The glory revealed in us is eternal. The hope of the eternal life in the family of God is the focal point of God's plan that enables us to continue enduring the hardships of this physical life. There once was a man in a congregation I served. Every Sabbath, he would come up, and he would hand me this handful of candy, put it in my jacket pocket. I got tired of explaining I didn't eat all that, but I just put it in my pocket. And he'd say, you want to know something? He'd say, eat when you're hungry, drink when you're dry. You'll live to 100 if you don't die. Every Sabbath. And I thought about that. You'll live to 100 if you don't die. He's dead now. I don't think he lived to 100. But if we look at this life, it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And you're going to get depressed and you're going to get discouraged and you're going to get despondent and you're going to get fear, full of fear. And sorry, but there ain't enough jabs to take to keep you from dying. Because eventually, you're going to die. And so am I. Am I looking forward to it? No. Do I want to? No. You know? I think about this with a granddaughter I have. I'm not going to live until she's 50. It's not going to happen. Some of you that I'm speaking to may be dead a year from now. I could be. Don't know. But we can't dwell on that. And oh, 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 we can't go outside. We can't do anything because oh, oh, and the weather, oh, and, my, and the money, oh, and hyperinflation, and oh, and ah, oh, ah, oh, right? And then you can't sleep. You can't eat because your gut's torn up because you're worried. We're human. I'm not about to tell you I don't do that. Yes, I worry. And so, the hope of eternal life enables us to keep going. Vigilance and focus are two separate but related qualities. We need to navigate the trials, the tribulations, and stay on course for eternal life. Vigilance, remaining alert to the dangers. Gulf Coast residents here, we are Prior to hurricanes and tropical storms, we do an assessment. Where are we living? Which zone? How bad is it? What's it really going to be like? Not what the media tells you. Do we put the hurricane shutters on and board it up? Do we evacuate? Well, if you're in zone one, you should when they tell you. If you're in zone four or five, it's like gambling. I don't know. Right? But you assess that. You're vigilant. You focus. You look to God and His promises to see through the difficulties. I have knelt down so many times and said, God, I have no idea what to do. I don't have the right decision. I can't even, as my poor wife did one time after a trial challenge we went through, sat on the bed. I was crying. I said, what's wrong? She says, I don't even, can't even make up my mind what to wear. Sad day. Shame on those that caused that. K 
Keeping God's holy days and weekly Sabbath help us remain vigilant and keenly focused on the plan of God. Romans 8.24, what does that say? Romans 8.24. Romans 8 and verse 24. We are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. What? Hope that you can see is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he hope for it? But if we hope for that that we don't see, then we do with patience wait for it. Patience is one of the fruits of God's Spirit that many of God's people, all of us at times, lack. We are extremely impatient. All you have to do is drive down to the Beach Express at turn certain times of the year here to learn patience and get down on the Gulf down by Perdido and through there and Gulf Shores and Orange Beach and pick your pick wherever here that we live. You're going to wait forever sometimes to get places. And if you're impatient, patient, you're going to end up in trouble. I gave a message. Uh, it's on our YouTube channel. I'll refer to it. Don't forget there is always hope. It was January 25th, 2020, and then Russell Redding, hi, Victoria Russell, um, they're already at the feast, I think. Also gave us one, our hope in Christ. That was August 21st, 2021. Those are both on the website. Verse 18. How was Paul, of Romans 8, verse 18, how was Paul able to make this statement? For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. How is he able to make that? Look at verse 19. Here's why. For the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. The change. For the creation was made subject to vanity, temporariness, but willingly by reason of him who had subjection to the same in hope, because the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. All this, oh, we're ruining the earth. Oh. What are you worried about? First of all, you're not, well, I better not get off on that. They will censor me into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know the whole creation groans. If it could talk, it would. Oh! And travails in pain until now. And not only they, but themselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, the sonship, to wit, the redemption of this body. He was focused on the hope of the first fruits. But he said, we still groan. Oh, man. Right? When you guys were sick with the virus, I remember talking to you. I would rather die. You felt awful. I felt awful for you, but I didn't feel as awful as you felt awful. Right? So you were groaning and moaning, understandably. And I may face that. I don't know. I don't want to say for a minute, oh, I have more faith. I won't get it. Don't go down that road. Any of us, be careful. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, over just a few pages, says this. If in this life only... We have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. If this is all we have is this life, right? Oh, it's going to be miserable. My wife made the comment last night, the world certainly isn't the same as it was a year ago or two years ago. It'll never be the same. It's not going back to normal, whatever that was. It's not. Sorry, it's not going back. 
How's that song go? It's too late to turn back now. Most people don't understand much about man's eternal destiny. The traditional Christians believe asserts the righteous go to heaven when they die because that's where God is, okay? But otherwise, the emphasis on Christ is largely a focus on this life. Do we see a connection between the problem and the fact that most don't keep the holy days? Most of the holidays, and please be careful when you state this to people, we observe the holy days. They are not God's holidays. That's important. And that slip comes out every so often. Huge difference. Day and night difference. Most of the holidays of traditional Christianity are this hodgepodge of customs that originated in paganism and were imported into Christian religion. They never came from God nor does he want us observing him. So can I say God says don't keep Halloween or Christmas? Yes, I can based on the authority of God's word. You shouldn't be partaking of it. The holy days, H-O-L-Y, new word, D-A-Y-S, which did come from God and he does want us observing remind you and me, focus and strengthen our hope on our future destiny. Here's a quote from John Ritchie from the Feast of Jehovah, as he calls it. The Feast of Jehovah all pointed toward onward to subjects of eternal interest, which in due time and order were to take their place in the marvelous chain of events, which when completed would show the infinite wisdom and love of God and all his purpose of grace toward the sons of men. They are each a shadow of things to come of which Christ is the body foreshadowing great events of the future, part of which have been fulfilled and part which still are to be. What did that mean? Let's go over to Colossians 2 because this is important. Colossians 2, verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you because of your eating and drinking in respect or talk, taking part in of a holy day or of a new moon or the Sabbath days or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but let the judge, the body, be of Christ. The holy days establish, as I call them, time markers that keep us focused on God's plan that provide an annual review of historical stages of God's plan of salvation, like a trail marker if you're walking or jogging, how far we've gone, where we're going. But they're perfectly aligned as you go and you know, okay, and I can tell you this after almost 60 years, I can tell you, guess what? After Passover, let's start with Passover. Forgiveness of sin via Christ, our Passover, sacrifice for us. I can tell you without even blinking, then comes the days of unleavened bread. Deliverance from coming out, putting out sin and putting Christ in us, Galatians 2.20. Then what do we come to? Pentecost, right? And you count the 50 days, coming of the Holy Spirit, the New Testament church, the spiritual first fruits. Christ being the first of the first fruits, all those things. Then you move on to what? The day of trumpets, the return of Jesus Christ at the seventh trumpet. Then you come to the day of atonement, which we kept a couple days ago. Putting away Satan, the world becoming at one with God. Then you go to the Feast of Tabernacles, the millennial rule of Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God for that thousand years. Then you come to the eighth day of the last great day, that second general resurrection of all those that have never been resurrected. It's the same thing every year. Oh, how boring. Is it boring? <coughs> what do we focus on? Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. 
Verse 18. Go with me if you would. By two immutable things in which was impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. That hope, that anchor for the soul, an anchor prevents drifting off course. Bill Garrett, I hope you don't mind me mentioning your name, but Bill and I went fishing. And the trolling motor went out and the regular motor went out. So we were out there fishing and we put a big anchor down on each end. And I said, Bill, those ropes look like they're worn pretty bad. We might lose an anchor. He said, yeah, we might. But And the wind was blowing just enough. And, it, and finally, we started really drifting. And I said, is your anchor still in? Yeah. I look, I don't have an anchor. I pulled up the rope. Okay. We drifted. And the holy days keep us on the path of God's plan so we don't drift. And yet people, how do you drift? God says keep the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. How do you drift? You only go to one, the first holy day, because you've got to work the other days. You might lose your job. And then the last one, you keep it. Well, you maybe don't go to work, but you stay home. And you just don't work. You're drifting. You're drifting. Some people go the second or third day of the feast because they don't want to spend the money for the whole time. And if the opening night's not important, and the first day, well, you know, we'll go to the other part. You're drifting. Right? I don't feel like going to church today. In fact, I'm not even going to hook up, one person told me. You're drifting. One of your anchors is broke. I didn't go to the Holy Day at all, but I go to Passover and come to the feast, but I don't go to the other ones. You're drifting. You're drifting. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 and 5 Hebrews 6, 4 and 5. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. We have tasted of the good word of God and the powers to come. How? Pentecost, you taste of the first fruits of God's Spirit, a reminder of our calling. Why are we called first? We have to rise above all this muck, our values. We were talking about this this morning. Oh, you're just ultra-conservative, right? So what, right? So what? The values, the focus of the world, and be ever mindful of the world to come, which, by the way, we're destined to help bring about. The Feast of Tabernacles offers a foretaste of that world, the other two fall holy days, trumpets and atonement, remindful of events of place, events that have to take place before the world tomorrow. Isaiah 66, 23 talks about the Sabbath. The new moons will be kept in the world tomorrow by all nations. And we're going to be some of the teachers to help folks learn the focus, the plan, the laws of God. Isaiah 30, verse 20, the New Living Translation says, Isaiah 30, 20, Though the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for drink, He will still be with you to teach you. You will see your teachers with your own eyes. Your own ears will hear them. Right behind you, a voice will say, This is how you do it. This is the way. Whether to the right or the left. Zechariah 14, verse 16, All nations will worship the Lord by keeping the feast. Again, we're going to be helping coordinate and conduct those Holy Day observances. Not only do God's Holy Days keep us focused, one of them offers us a break from the world. You remember McDonald's? You deserve a break today. We may not deserve a break, but we sure do need one occasionally, don't we? Not a break like your hip, but a break like... Leviticus 23. Let's look at Leviticus 23. On the 15th day, verse 39, 
On the seventh month, when you gather in the produce of the land, you must celebrate a pilgrim festival of the Lord for seven days. For seven days. For seven days. This is a recording. On the first day is a complete rest. On the eighth day is a complete rest. On the first day, you must take for yourselves branches from majestic trees, palm branches, branches of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you must rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Seven days. Seven days. You must celebrate it as a pilgrim festival for the Lord for seven days in the year. This is a perpetual state. Throughout your generations, you must celebrate it in the seventh month. You must live in temporary shelters for seven days. And every native citizen in Israel must live in temporary shelters so that your future generation may know that I made the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. It is possible, friends, to become virtually swallowed up by the circumstances of our personal lives to the extent as all we can see are the problems and the pressures. It's illustrated by the parable of the sower. And I'll not read it, but I'd ask you to read it. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 to 23. Matthew 13, 1 to 23. A change of environment can help us regain our focus. The Feast of Tabernacles allows us that blessing for eight days. It's like being uprooted from the rocky soil and the weeds and replanted in rock-free, weed-free, fertile soil being watered and fertilized daily for that eight days. So we have the opportunity in this life to observe God's holy days, to learn about, review, rehearse the key aspects of God's plan to help us refocus and set our minds on the spiritual truths, on the things above. We all have, me included, way too many things distracting us from what's important. Admit it. I have to admit it. There's too many things pulling me away from the things that are above. As first fruits of God's spiritual creation, as pioneers blazing a trail for mankind to eventually follow, as disciples, students, a class of Christ preparing to be teachers, helping us to remain vigilant and focused so we don't miss out on the fulfillment of God's plan that we're destined to be active participants in. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 25 says, We are admonished to persevere and remain focused. I want to ask again the questions that I posed at the beginning of this message, because you may have forgotten them, and trust that you will know why I asked them and what the answers are now. What kind of problems and pressures have you been through in the past year? Some of them self-inflicted, self-induced, some of them reaction, some of them we had no control over. Why are God's holy days so important? How much are we looking forward to the Feast of Tabernacles in two days? Acts chapter 18, verse 21. Acts chapter 18 and verse 21. Let's go there. Bade them for well, there's Paul, I must by all means keep this feast that comes in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. Paul said, I must by all means keep this feast. Where he was at that time was several hundred miles from there. Let's be sure to prepare our minds and our hearts to benefit fully from this festival season. By keeping God's holy days, we will remain vigilant, focused on God's plan, and actively prepare to fulfill our destiny in the family of God. Let us focus our mind, please, brethren, you and me, on the things that are above, not on these earthly things. And the peace that passes all understanding, the blessing with God's Spirit, will transform us to a place some of us haven't been for a while. If you'd rise and join me, we'll close in prayer today.
Our Father in heaven, we come before you and Jesus Christ at your right hand. We love you. We thank you. Father, encourage us, strengthen us, help us as we now prepare to keep your Feast of Tabernacles an eighth day or last great day. Help us to be filled with your spirit, with power, with wisdom, with strength. Protect us from the evil one. Help us, encourage us. Father, this world is temporary. It passes away. Things are going to get worse and worse and more challenging. Will we be a light? What will our focus be? Will our prayer be and remain? Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Go with us, encourage us, be with us. Please bless this meal today. Strengthen us and all those traveling. Father, give us the peace that comes from your son, Jesus Christ, in you through that spirit. And we pray and ask this and thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.